You want to know what sets building a baseball team apart from sports like football and basketball? In the NFL, there are certain things you usually need, like a star quarterback and a solid defense. It's been nicknamed the copycat league for a reason after all. And in the NBA, you usually need a legitimate superstar or two to get your team even in the conversation of contending. In baseball, there aren't really historical requirements for what you need to build a championship team. So what we're going to do is take the last 20 teams to win the World Series and determine the biggest strength of their roster to see if there's a theme. There's definitely not one way to approach building a great team and methods will change over time, but let's get right into what every champion since 2000 did right after a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Exter. Exter is a provider of high quality wallets and other accessories. Their wallets are sleek, come in premium material, have a variety of colors, and quick card access. They're also RFID protected for extra security. With the push of a button, you can easily reach one of up to six regular sized cards stored in the slot. There are also additional pouches for more cards or an optional solar powered and voice activated tracker you can purchase with your wallet and sync with your phone to make it traceable worldwide. So if you're interested in buying yourself or someone you know a smart wallet, Exter has you covered. And you can use code STARK15 as shown on your screen for 15% off on your purchase. Thanks to Exter for the sponsor, now back to the video. The 2000 Yankees won their fourth title in five years that season, and while their championship experience was absolutely a huge reason for them winning again, the biggest asset of their roster was veteran hitting. The youngest everyday player in the lineup was 26 years old and in his fifth full season. You might have heard of him. He was in The Other Guys and Seinfeld. Hey, we won the World Series. In six games. <laughs> Six of the nine Yankees with the most plate appearances that season hit over 280, which was huge. The team was not among the elites in the AL for power numbers, so this was more of a contact-focused lineup, even though they were one of the most balanced teams on this list. The 2001 Diamondbacks' greatest strength was 100% their pitching, more specifically their starting rotation. Luis Gonzalez did rake that year, but they had possibly the two best pitchers in baseball on the same team. Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling were maybe the best one-two punch a team has ever had. And with pitchers like Byung Hyun Kim, Miguel Batista, Albi Lopez, and Brett Prinz also serving as strong contributors, the Diamondbacks pitched their way to their first ever ring. The 2002 Angels are probably most known for having a rally monkey jump up and down on their Jumbotron, but that's not what got the team to the World Series. The Angels had a great contact hitting lineup. This team struck out by far the least in baseball that year, and simply knew how to get hits. With a league-leading team batting average of 282, seven of their nine regulars hit higher than that and their top four bench bats did too. Guys like Garrett Anderson, David Eckstein, Darren Erstad, and Adam Kennedy were consistently tough outs. And Troy Gloss smacked 30 homers too, but also the Rally Monkey helped. The 2003 Marlins are... weird, and by far the hardest team to pick a number one strength for. You could argue their contact hitting with guys like Juan Pierre, Pudge Rodriguez, and Luis Castillo all being strong table setters for the offense, but their team batting average was only two points higher than league average, and their OPS was one point under league average. However, their team ERA was noticeably above average, and they were third in team FIP, which it seems makes their pitching the number one asset this team had. You want to know what else this team had, though, other than good starting pitching? Juan Pierre spit in a crazy freestyle after the team got to the World Series. We the Florida Marlins, we came and got it started. We shot the world and you know we go either started. I don't care if it's Boston, I don't care New York. We coming from the real and we coming with some heart. They say we couldn't do it, but we yo we did. We coming to the world. The 2004 Red Sox pitching staff had the third best ERA plus and FIP in baseball that year, and they weren't even the best part of the team. As if having two 40 home run hitters in the lineup didn't give that away. The 04 Red Sox led baseball in OPS, slugging percentage, doubles, and batting average. To say this in as few words as possible, they could rake. The 05 White Sox are a sort of forgotten group, but they had the best pitching staff in the American League. With the best ERA plus in baseball and four starters with above average ERAs, their rotation was the backbone of the team. The bullpen had some lights out contributors too, like Dustin Hermanson, Bobby Jenks, Neil Kotz, and Cliff Polite, 
Not really any big time names on the staff, but they got great value out of the pieces they had. When I was growing up, there were two right-handed hitters you wanted no part of. The first was Pablo Sanchez. The second was Albert Pujols. Albert Pujols was one of the most consistent hitters in the world while he was in St. Louis, and arguably carried the 2006 Cardinals to a World Series himself. The 2019 Diamondbacks had a better regular season record than the World Series winning 06 Cardinals. This team was on paper no better than the fourth best team in the National League that year. It's not fair to say Albert Pujols alone was the main roster strength of this team, so to be more specific, it was their power hitting lineup. Scott Rowland made for a valuable number two in that lineup, but guys like Jim Edmonds, Chris Duncan, and Juan Encarnacion clobbered baseballs that year too. The 07 Red Sox are basically the same deal as 04. The pitching staff was statistically even better than the 04 teams relative to their competition. But first and foremost, this was a slugging team. The best hitters from the first World Series team were still there and still mashing. The team was top 5 in baseball in runs per game, doubles, and OPS+. Big Poppy and Manny Ramirez raked to earn a second ring and the Red Sox extended their World Series winning streak to 8 games. Two sweeps in a row is pretty impressive. You know who else was a great slugging team? The 2008 Phillies. This team would destroy baseballs. They had three 30 plus home run hitters, another guy who hit 24, and another guy who hit 38 doubles. The team led the NL in homers, were second in runs per game, and third in OPS plus and total bases. Also, good luck tracking down a Ryan Howard home run ball from around this time because he basically took pitchers to the moon. Miller, and that ball is absolutely hammered. Keeping up with the trend, the 2009 Yankees also destroyed baseballs. This group of power hitters led the league in runs per game, home runs, on-base percentage, slugging percentage, and total bases. They also walked the most and struck out the second least in the American League. The 09 Yankees had maybe the best offensive infield ever. Three of the four hit 25 home runs or more, and the fourth was the man from the other guys we mentioned earlier who hit 334 that year. Three other regulars in the lineup hit over 20 homers too. All in all, this team knew how to score as efficiently as they could. So, uh, the next team is the 2010 Giants. You may or may not know that those Giants won three championships in five years, and their biggest strength was the exact same thing each time. So let's talk about the Giants' great pitching all at once. Each Giants team to win the World Series in the 2010s was led by its starting pitchers. In 2010, the Giants were near or at the top of the list for basically every single good pitching stat you can think of. And that year, you had almost no shot against their best relievers. In 2012, they did have by far their best offensive year of the three with league MVP Buster Posey. This team was still led by a dominant pitching group. Still towards the top end of many valuable team stats, Matt Cain was great again, and Madison Bumgarner and Ryan Vogelsong also turned in good years. Their bullpen was fantastic again too. And the 2014 team had decent offensive numbers, but their pitching was well above average while their hitting bordered around league average. Having playoff Madison Bumgarner helps too. So yeah, the three Giants teams that won the World Series were very starting pitching dominant. The 2011 Cardinals were still led by Albert Pujols, but this time they were more of a contact team. Contact hitting and getting on base were the priorities of this group. They led the National League in hits, batting average, on-base percentage, slugging percentage, and runs per game while striking out the least in baseball. The weirdest part is that they were only third in doubles and weren't even top five in their league in home runs. Not something you'd expect from a team that easily led their league in runs and slugging percentage. The 2013 Red Sox were, again, led by sluggers. Not home run hitting though. They were only fifth in the AL in that. This team did lead all of baseball in doubles by a wide margin. Two guys hit 40 doubles in their lineup, and David Ortiz was still here having more great production. They also led baseball in on-base percentage, slugging percentage, and total bases. The Red Sox, at least over the last 20 years or so, seemed to like building around guys who could crush the ball if it wasn't clear by now. Guys, we have a new biggest strength for the first time since 2004. The 2015 Royals only finished in the top 5 in the AL in one major offensive category, and that was batting average. Their starting pitching was nowhere near the best in baseball. Where this team really shined was its bullpen. 
Greg Holland, Kelvin Herrera, Ryan Madsen, and Franklin Morales were all dependable, but this was Wade Davis's world and we just lived in it. League average for ERA plus is always 100. His was 448. Scoring on Wade Davis was about as realistic as pigs flying. If the Royals had a lead by like the fifth or sixth inning of a game that year, they probably won. The 2016 Cubs roster is most likely going to be remembered for having Chris Bryant and Anthony Rizzo leading the lineup. Bryant won the MVP that year, but aside from them, the lineup may not have been as overpowered as you remember. Four regulars in the lineup hit under 240 on the season, but it was enough because their starting pitching was by far the best in baseball. The Cubs gave up the least runs in baseball while also having the best whip, most shutouts, and third most strikeouts. One more stat to show how dominant their pitchers were. Every one of their main five starters had an above average ERA for the whole year. Also, rumor had it that their backup catcher was pretty much immortal. Alright, so next up is the 2017 Astros. If this video was made before November 2019, the clear answer would have been their deep contact oriented lineup, but it's been proven that the team was up to some unethical activity to help them win that year, so we're not going to talk about them anymore. The 2018 Red Sox are a lot of the same. Their biggest strength was their balanced but still contact oriented lineup led by Mookie Betts, but this team has also received discipline for some rule bending. Not nearly to the extent of the Astros, but it'd be wrong not to mention. And finally, the 2019 Washington Nationals. After a 19-31 start through 50 games, the Nats turned it around thanks to some great starting pitching. Like the 2016 Cubs, all five guys who made the most starts for them had above average ERAs. The difference was, the 2019 Nats didn't lead the league in any major pitching category. That didn't stop them though. For years a big stigma around the Nationals was that their bullpen was far worse than their rotation, so the Nationals thought up a solution to that problem in the 2019 playoffs. Use some starters out of the bullpen. It definitely helped. So we've gotten through all the teams. Let's see what we've got. Based on our rough analysis of all these teams, we took a tally of where the best strengths were. The top three aren't too far apart from each other, but for the first 20 champions of this century, their most common top asset was their starting pitching. We probably opened up chaos in the comments about this conclusion, and maybe with time, teams will make it outdated, but that's it for now. Thank you for watching. Feel free to follow us on social media, and uh, yeah, thanks. See you around.